I'm very happy to be here. Can you hear me now? Um, I'm indebted to the organizers and the hosts uh, for uh, this opportunity to speak to you and share some ideas. Still on. Closer, not further. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, I'd like to welcome all of you, and I thank you for coming to share this time, and a special welcome to students. Ahlam Biko. Today, um, I'd like to ask you to come along with me for a walk. Uh, we look at the story of Arabic script, and my aim is not to provide a full exhaustive history, but rather to look at tendencies, trends, turning points, uh, important changes, and so on. Of course, uh, it shows my point of view, so please don't feel obligated to believe it, but I'm, I'm just going to share it with you. <clears throat> Arabic had a very simple beginning. Uh, this is one of the oldest inscriptions found that is undoubtedly written in Arabic script. Uh, I can't read it, but I mean, scholars venture interpretations, but that's not really what's important. This script was found on this lintel stone, which shows three languages together. Shows on the top right is Greek, uh, on the left is Syriac, and on the bottom is this Arabic. Here, this is traced to make it more visible. Uh, one character that's unmistakably recognizable here is the Lam Aleph. But we'll see as we take our walk that many changes happen to Arabic script and they happened over the centuries. Uh, this inscription was found and well, is dated to 512 AD near, uh, near Aleppo. And as you can see, the lines, should we, the, the sound is echoing. Can we, can we do without one? All right, excuse me for the interruption. Um, and it's very, it's interesting that the, um, none of the script, none of the inscriptions on the stone are done in a particularly elegant or sophisticated way. Certainly not the Syriac, which looks extremely primitive here for, for that date. This is another one of those uh, early inscriptions dated to 568, these dates are Please take them very approximately because they always change with new information. Near Haran, as you can see, the forms are all very angular. And in terms of geometric shapes, they're very similar to the writings of Syriac script. This, is, this has been interpreted, and it's, it, for us in this age, um, it's somewhat legible. It says, Ana Sharhil ibn Talamu. And uh, the forms are very archaic and look a bit strange. Uh, we see some echo of these forms in Kufic styles. This one is from the sixth century as well. Uh, it looks to me like a very unskilled hand. And except for the lamb, elephant, certain other sequences, I certainly wouldn't have recognized it as Arabic. Um, the question comes up, where did Arabic script come from? Uh, it seems to have appeared out of nowhere. And of course, there are many, many opinions about that fact. Uh, this is an inscription in the Nabataean script, in Arabic Nabati. And it's quite, it's quite interesting to look at the lines as they are written. And we don't, we don't really see a lot of visual similarity to Arabic writing, but many scholars feel this is the predecessor of Arabic writing. 
this is a derivative of uh, Imperial Aramaic, which was the script and language used throughout the Persian empires, successive Persian em empires. And um, Nabataean basically is a transformation of the Aramaic script. Now, um, the Nabataean nation had grown quite strong as a commercial people along the path of the North Arabian desert, basically in today's Jordan. And the Romans weren't very happy about their power and came through and destroyed their kingdom. And as the archeological finds in, uh, in Jordan tell us, it was a very advanced civilization. So with the death of the Nabataean nation, the script grew out of favor and out of use. Next, we look at this script, Syriac. Uh, this is an, an early form of Syriac. It's not, not a very sophisticated mosaic, but we see certain characteristics that um, resemble Arabic writing. Um, it's not very different in appearance from the first inscription I had shown. Notice that some of the letters are connected like this, and some are separate. Here is Syriac in a later, more sophisticated form in the manuscript. Of course, in the manuscript, there's more, more control than over the shape in a mosaic, which was quite rough. <clears throat> if we compare the visual appearance of Nabataean and the visual appearance of Syriac, uh, we see the overall flow of Arabic script reflected in Syriac. Now, there are some some letters in the Nabataean alphabet that uh, look quite similar to the Arabic alphabet. And scholars have wasted a lot of time arguing over which one is the mother script. My opinion is honestly, it's both. So uh, the historian Al Baladuri tells us that three men from the clan of Tai wrote Arabic, invented Arabic script along the lines of Syriac. So they, he didn't say they, he, they took it from Syriac. There's the system which is similar to Syriac. And the one very, there, there are a couple of features here which are very important to see. Um, Syriac rests on a baseline, which is quite predictable. When we look, when we look at Nabataean, it doesn't have a baseline. It's actually hanging from a line so we can see consistency in alignment here. And letters hang to different depths from, from the top line, somewhat like some Indian scripts. But there are shapes in the Nabataean alphabet that look like their predecessors to Arabic. And I don't really see a problem with giving both scripts <laughs> a hand. They derive from it, but uh, the inventors obviously get some credit too. This is an interesting inscription in this large rock. And the, the presence of the guard here gives us an idea, a good idea of the scale, the size of these letters. This is from Tai, and it's uh, dated to 677. Here we see we're focusing on, on the inscription. And here's a tracing of the inscription, which at this point, is quite legible to, to people in this modern age. It says, هَذَا السَّدْ لَعَبْدَ اللَّهِ مُعَوَيَّةً أَمِير الْمُؤْمِنِينَ بَنَيْهِ and so on. Now, you notice there are uses, there is use of dots that uh, are on some letters, not on all of them. For example, here, مُؤْمِنِينَ has no docking, and it was expected that you'd be able to, to guess what it says. Some other interesting features, the Aleph is not a straight stick up and down, but it has this foot to the right, it has a bend to the right. Uh, the letter Ain is open. It's 
not a closed triangle, it's two diagonals. Uh, there's visual similarity between the form for DAL and the form for CAP. And we see this often in, in styles that are called Kufi, but uh, here the similarity is very, very exaggerated. And we notice, of course, that like all the letters are linked except for some of them, like the K at the end or the Aleph at the end, and this is still true today. So what's interesting about Syriac writing is that it has a series of letters too that only link on the right. And many of those match the ones in Arabic. So to me, that's, that's a birthmark that's very, very difficult to ignore. Notice the, um, the re is quite small in size. The final nun is deep, but it doesn't form, it doesn't form a full bowl. Okay, so there are features here that are quite antiquated. This sign is a milestone on the road to Jerusalem. It's dated to 692. And here the forms are extremely recognizable. This inscription, the, the forms of the letters are extremely consistent. There are straight lines, there are arcs. Uh, shapes are repeated very predictably. This look of the meme, the look of the ta, the look of the aim. All these, all these features are very finely done. The aleph again has a foot. It's not just a straight up and down. The, let's see here, this is us. Abdullah. Abdullah. Abdul Malik Amin al Mu'minin. So this repeats the phrase we have seen before. Amir al Mu'minin. The form of the re and the wow are relatively similar in size, whereas we saw in previous inscriptions where the, the re was very tiny in proportion. So here we're seeing developments that foretell things that came before. So within the arc of roughly two centuries, Arabic script went from this very simple uh, angular form oops, to this inscription, which is quite sophisticated. So we'd, I'd like to take you through um, a series of styles that show progression over time of the different styles that were available in different areas at different times. And <clears throat> one thing that, uh, one mistake we can make in the 20th and the 21st century is that we see a lot of these styles together. We're, we're used to seeing them as if they appeared at the search time and we say, okay, I'll, we'll do this, we'll do this logo in a kufi, and we'll do this in a mask, and we'll do this in a Farsi and so on and on. These forms were not always co-present. That took many, many, many centuries to happen. And their, um, their abundance co-present happened only after the arrival of printing. This style is called Ma'il because it's, it's leaning. And I think the the scribe who wrote this probably pushed the italic button by mistake and sent the whole page leaning right. So it's quite interesting to see Arabic, which is leaning backwards towards, towards the right. Nowadays, we, we tend to think if you want to show something as casual, maybe you'll lean to the other side, but there's no specific rule. But it's interesting to see that this is from around 700 AD. It's a Quran. And very likely it comes from the northern part of the Arabian Peninsula. So a lot of the styles that people often call Kufi would, would be better called Hagazi. That's coming from the Hagaz, from northern Arabia. And this is one of them. Certainly we see a lot of, a lot of features here which are later developed in Kufic styles and other styles as well. Um, 
the the aleph is almost without a foot, but it does have a bend to the right. Um, the calf and the del have differentiated, uh, becoming distinctly different. Um, the re in this style is still extremely small. So you see ar-Rahman, ar-Rahim, and you see the noon is deep and has a has a bend to the left, but it's certainly not a bow yet. So um, there are many many such features. The lamb aleph is everywhere. So that's a common feature. The line, media line, is still is still open and triangular. So in in some ways, some features have have um, have remained the same, and some new features have appeared. We start to see combinations like this, where it, letters are stacked on top of each other. Okay, and this is you can see the same thing repeat throughout here. We see a relatively new form for the ye, which is the tail swinging back uh, behind the preceding letters. So there are many features here that are embryonic and have persisted in Arabic styles since then. Here's another manuscript from around 700 AD. And we see the letters are very compressed, very dark. Um, certainly not all that easy to read. There's pointing, but it's not standard points that we would recognize today. There were many varieties of, of this kind of pointing, and they, they varied. Um, we have a little telltale symbol here, where we see a cursive hand along alongside, which is much more readable. So. Uh, I would guess that the, these forms were meant more to be stunning visually than to be uh, vi not than to be legible. Here's a sample uh, written on papyrus. This is from Egypt. It's uh, dated around 710. So about the same time as the two samples we've seen before. Um, this is something administrative, and it's obviously meant to be very legible. Um, it's obvious that people have adopted new media. Papyrus didn't exist much outside of Egypt and Sicily. So um, there, there's the use of ink rather than inscription. And it's, not on, and it's not on leather. It's not on parchment. So we see here, again, the re is very small. The noon takes a rounding, but it doesn't make a full bowl. The form of the initial ha looks extremely uh, similar to the form uh, of the gim in Syria. We see the ye that swings back. Again, similarity between the dal and the kaf, but the kaf is very stretched and could not possibly be confused with the dal anymore. I thought I had which was open here. Does anyone see it? From about the same period, uh, this is a letter on parchment, but it's not from Egypt. It's from Central Asia. So we're speaking of places that would be around Afghanistan or eastern Iran in that area, or north of Iran. And we see a very fluid hand here. This is somebody who's quite practiced. Uh, the lamb aleph stands out everywhere. The final mean is very deep, has a downward stroke. Uh, things have changed, but you know, this today we don't have an exact name to give this style. This is like something that's happening that's happening in progression. And as we can see, the dots are taking predictable forms, forms that we recognize even today. Let's look for the aleph. Now, the Alice don't have a foot to the right anymore. They lost their foot, but they gained a bit of curvature. Uh, and what's in interesting to see is at the end of the word, the Alice is attached to what precedes it, but it's not linked. So it's, it's not a direct stroke coming out of its neighbor. Basically, it's a stroke that's put down 
and connected, but very visibly everywhere, it's, it's quite separate. It's distinct. Uh, the ye, so the cap here is elongated to fill the line. This is the <laughs> so the habit for the tatwil is not something new. It's something quite ancient. Of course, it varies in form from age to age. The medial he has the form of the double knot. Here we're looking at an example from Baghdad, dated to 866, a style that is sometimes called Warraqi. And I see basically here a, a tremendous flowing together of different styles. So people um, in countries that are using Arabic scripts, this is only the second or third century, are inventing new ways of writing. And what's very interesting is that there are obviously multiple ways of writing. Because if we look here, these small notes squeezed inside are in a style that are much more casual and look a lot more like a Nas uh, writing would be today. Whereas this one is still um, reminiscent of inscription and, and quite dark. So this co-presence of styles begins to begins to appear and doesn't mean that everywhere there are all the styles all together. But something like this, for example, would not be found in Morocco. Okay, so this is this is in Mesopotamia. Let's look at the Aleph. The Aleph has increased in its curvature even more. Uh, in final position, it's still distinctly unlinked, although attached. It doesn't flow out. Uh, the lamb, final lamb is now deep. It, again, it's still not a full bowl. So there, there are many, many features uh, here that are still reminiscent, reminiscent of the previous one. However, uh, let me find an example of a media line here. Here's an initial. Here's a media line, and it's no longer two diagonals. It has filled to the triangular form. This is Quran on parchment, and uh, it's extremely, it's extremely dark and decorative, uh, quite distinct from the small note on top here, which looks like a possible relative style, but um, certainly doesn't have the darkness or the effect of the rest of the page. Um, this is much more readable than the remainder in the text, and I think, again, the impression uh, this is meant to be a beautiful piece of art rather than for direct reading. Interesting to see that the Aleph here looks like a continuation stroke. So we don't have the bottom part of the Aleph sticking out. Here we see what's distinctly a form of a Beh Aleph connected. So it's it's quite interesting that changes are happening. Actually, I... I I'm not sure whether this is just an Aleph alone or a connection. It will be left to guess. Uh, this is from the year 902, a manuscript of the New Testament on parchment. And here's a style which, again, um, previously unseen in other locations. Um, the writing is not all that precise, although over the extent of the whole page, it's quite uh, quite accurate, quite faithful to one style. And here we start seeing more more stacking of letters, the calf the calf hanging over. So there there are some features that are beginning to come out here that have not been seen before. The noon. The noon in a separate shape is a full bowl now. It's no longer a half bowl. The Nam Aleph is still very recognizable and dominant. Uh, the pattern for God, Allah, is taking on a distinctive shape that we would continue to see for centuries to come. 
the final mean is not as deep as the cases where it's, it dips below as a stick. Uh, the IN has now closed and is a full triangle. So things keep changing in different directions. We haven't found we haven't found a consistent path in anyone, but it tells us there was a great deal of invention, and um, obviously more and more people were learning how to write, and some of these scribes were being adventurous in giving giving samples their own style. So we're losing the angular look here, and we're gaining a curvaceous look. Again, another sample of something which is quite round now. The angularity has, has been greatly reduced. And this is from Persia. It's a Quran on parchment. Um, the beginning phrase here is in a very decorative alternative style. It has nothing to do with the rest of the text. The rest of the text is fully pointed and fully vocalized. There's tashkil here to basically render a text unambiguously. So this, this is aiming for legibility and not for decoration. We even have, we even have marks for the tanween here, which is something we haven't seen before. Now, another style from Persia, a bit later, which is called the broken cursive. Frankly, I don't know the name for this in Arabic. If, if you know the name, let me know, please, afterwards. Broken cursive, were there angles, um, breaks, triangular breaks in the shapes and so on. Um, there's dipping below the baseline in making the connection, and the dipping is very, is very angular. Um, we can see that the Hamza is being marked. The medial He is in the double knot shape. So again, this is a style we haven't seen. So between, between Jerusalem and between Persia, many things have changed. And we see the use of color here, multiple ink. The, um, the Aleph has taken on this decorative serif called the Zulfa on top. And this we have not seen before. The calf has a, a diagonal that breaks backwards even. So behind this, there must have been somebody who said, I'm going to do it a different way. <laughs> this doesn't happen accidentally. And this somebody has practiced quite quite hard to give predictable, predictably repetitive results. Here we're moving more into what we recognize. Uh, this is from the year 1001, Quran from Baghdad, and it's recognizable, recognizable as a mess, as a natural style. We see the decorative insertion here, the gilded writing in a completely different style. We see this poofy like insertion here. Um, we see this annotation Makkeya about the about the the book. So there there are many, many elements here and we see we have full tashkil on everything, full vocalization, full pointing. Everything is meant to be legible, predictably legible. Now notice we've lost practically all angularity here in straight straight lines. The, the ha is no longer a triangle that dips below the line. Um, it's taking on, it still has a point, but it's very curvaceous in the way it recedes back to the rest of the word. These are the closing pages of a Quran. From 1100, <clears throat> and we see some interesting things here. Is that the script is is very round. The script in here is square, squarish, poofy. And 
things are very connected. Things have taken on a rounding, like this dial taking on this dip that would not have been seen before. We see the bowl of the scene and the moon stretch downward. And one can see here um, predecessor to the style of Nasr and, and, and Solus, especially in these, in these composite forms and the, the length of the stroke. But as we look here, this doesn't look perfect to our modern eyes. We recognize the style. It's well practiced. But if you write at this level in a professional calligraphy school now, you would not be at the top of the class. Here's testimony to the use of the rhombic dot as measuring and the circle, the enclosed circle. Uh, the writing is very consistent, but it's casual. It doesn't have this kind of perfection that we often would expect from somebody professional. So one could call it a quick hand nest. From 1256, the Quran, written in Moroccan Maghrebi style. And this style was more or less restricted to Andalusia and Northwest Africa. And developed quite uh, developed uh, there and became became natives basically. Uh, we see some features we've seen in other scripts like the stacking stacking of beginning letters, lam lam mean, and so on. We see features that are now creeping across different styles. The, the dip of the final mean is very deep. Um, to me, when I when I saw this the first time as a child, I remember thinking this is like art naive, naive art. It's something that to me looked like looked childish. Of course, I mean that, that was my perception, and I had never seen how well developed and consistent it was, because it, basically to the Egyptian environment, it's completely foreign. Notice that the illumination here. The gilded illumination is in a Kufic, which has nothing to do stylistically with the rest of the page. Here we're coming closer to home. This is uh, penned in 1286, the Quran, done in Baghdad by the master calligrapher Yaqut. And this is uh, Muhaqqa style. So here we're starting to reach new levels of consistency and sophistication that we hadn't seen before. However, to my eyes, it doesn't look perfect either. It looks beautiful, but it doesn't look perfect. This is done a few years later. It's a colophon of, a, of the Quran, back page. And it's also muhaqat by a disciple of Yahud. But if you give me the choice between Yahud and his disciple, I would bow down before the disciple. <laughs> this is, we, we, we've reached, in this kind of look, we reached a certain mathematical perfection that for the successive centuries would become a new standard. And I think in some ways might, might have hindered some innovation because you had to first match this level before you could do anything different. This is an interesting practice page, a calligraphy page. <clears throat> the master, uh, Ahmad Rumi, wrote this in Persia around 1400 to 1050. He wrote this first entry. Everything else is done by other calligraphers who actually took some liberties in embellishing and changing proportions and so on. So you see this very long scene in contrast to the one on top. The spacing is different elsewhere. Every one of these has introduced some kind of small touch that would be uh, indicative, um, indicative of their their desire of being to be a, uh, distinct. Here, there's a very bad calligrapher. They didn't have an eraser or blade here. The end of the 15th century. Uh, this is in Herat, which today would be in Afghanistan, Sunnah Salih. And 
we we start to reach levels of beauty at the page at the page level which uh was previously uh, not imagined okay um, the art that starts being produced in central asia and further east takes on its own character and has a as a decorative intention for the whole page to give an impression. I would call this a very sublime impression. We can see the notes enclosed here are in other recognized styles. So here we see mixing. And again, uh, this is one of those incredible uh, feats of art where these letters are actually cut out of colored paper. So if you keep that in mind, it, you know, to do this with modern scissors, scissors would be <laughs> incredible, but to do that with something in 1490, with the tools of 1490, I, I really can't imagine how they would possibly achieve this level. Obviously, besides replicating the shapes, somebody had to write these first, and then somebody had to cut out a piece that that resembled it. 1540 from Shiraz, Iran. We see again several mixes of styles, Mahakas, uh, Solos, and the main text in Nas. And at this point, the art that's coming out from various courts and so on has, is reaching levels of of perfection had previously been unthinkable. <clears throat> Here is uh, a copy made by Ahmad al Nairizi of, a, of his master called Kumi, 1708. This is done 100 years after the master had died. And we see uh, mixing with angularity and, and so on. There, there's a lot of attention here to the color, overall color and appearance of the page. Uh, this is the Wani script, which is a very uh, late comer in the Ottoman times and a lot often ignored in, in many books, not really, um, not really cited. And obviously, uh, very few people were able to write the script and that's why it's called Diwani, it meant government house. So basically, it was a way of, of showing that something was likely coming from an official authority of some kind. Another latecomer, which was the workhorse of, of modern sign making in places like Egypt, the Reqa. And surprisingly enough, it, it did not spread eastward. So you would not readily see this in Iran, for example. You, some of there is some presence in India, but again, it's not. It didn't sur survive to the present day. As you can see, this text is not Arabic. If you try to read it, you'll see that <laughs> it won't make sense. My guess is it's Turkish. Thomas, would you confirm? It is. Okay, and I can see the Izafi here. <laughs> so there are features here that you would not find in Arabic writing. This is how we see Arabic from a static point of view. Okay. Everything from beginning to end, all together. Uh, you could think of them as siblings and cousins and nieces and nephews, all sitting together. And we have the illusion that they all appeared at the same time. They're each usable anytime we wish. And why shouldn't we? Okay. So the pro proliferation of mixing of styles is something that um, happened with the coming of printing. I mean, to this extent. There was always mixing where we saw like one or two or three maybe styles, but uh, never, never this impression that all these styles are modern and valid and for now. But also with the slight implication that these are the only styles. <laughs> so let's talk about typesetting and printing. Uh, when Gutenberg 
uh, came up with moving types. Um, he was not thinking as a type designer. Gutenberg had one idea in mind. If the scribe takes a year to write this, I want to be able to imitate the style of that scribe so well and do it so quickly that people will be, will be ready to buy these copies very similar to the originals, but of course much cheaper. So the demand for printed matter for duplication was behind this. And he really killed himself to imitate all sorts of abbreviations and combinations and so on that we would think un unthinkable today. We would, not, we would never do. But he had no concept of innovation. That's not what he was aiming for. And that, that's a bit uh, similar to the entry of Arabic into typesetting. Uh, without um, giving a total history, basically um, the first entry of what I consider valid Arabic typesetting happened in Turkey. This is the, um, the Mutafarika uh, print, uh, print house. It's a, it's a very faithful imitation of Nast style. Um, again, the, the thought here was to present something that looks acceptable. People that were used to seeing calligraphy, you had to imitate it well enough for them to find it reasonable to look at. There were many, uh, many European attempts at doing something similar, but frankly, the, the stuff that they produced was so ignorant of what's acceptable as legible style that it really doesn't make sense to spend any time on that. Here's a closer look at the text. And you see how all sorts of combinations and, and links and so on that are normal in NAS are done here. The one thing that's slightly different is that everything is completely flat at the baseline, whereas the calligrapher's hand usually had a slightly, uh, slightly angled uh, form of the word. Here's another example from the same house. Again, this is not Arabic text. Now, let's jump across um, the Mediterranean to the Bulak Press and the development that happened here uh, in Egypt. This is uh, from 1867, text that is set in Nas. Again, quite handsome, uh, very regular. Uh, certainly more regular than the previous temples uh, we've looked at. Here's a close-up of some of the forms. And we see uh, a problem that comes up in metal setting of Arabic in that the forms cannot overlap, so they often will have points of white, white break. The inking covers much of that, but um, in, uh, in this very ambitious attempt to do an astalik style, um, the connections are very approximate, but it gives a nice overall impression for heading. You can see here, for example, this is probably these two forms, the mean and the femar buta, were probably not the correct ones uh, to be chosen. But it's a very, very admirable attempt at doing things. To do this, you have to compensate for height which uh, will lead eventually to the death of the sloping script in typesetting. Here's another uh, Nastalik uh, insert, greatly enlarged. And here we can, see, we can see the problems of disconnections and so on. But from, from a distant look, it gives a good impression. Quite strangely, this is my Rebi style done in Egypt in, at the Bulak Press of 1867. Um, it was a very ambitious undertaking and wanted to do cover a lot of different styles and possibilities. Meanwhile, on the Eastern Mediterranean in Beirut, uh, this is a style done by the American press. And it looks to me like it's, it's basically a nasty 
style, but with some infusion of solo. So it's not it's not a pure nas style, but it's very elegant and stands out on the on the page. And as you can see, they have quite ambitious composition here of stacked of stacked forms. By the early 20th century, uh, the style used by the Bulak or Amirea press had become quite recognized. This is a copy, this is a picture of the, of the case layout from that time, from the early uh, 20th century. This is, a, this is a real copy from the monotype archives in England. And somebody spilled oil. <laughs> Why? next to a machine on it, and you can see it, it, it remained with this oil stain for the next few decades. So what's happening here is an interesting tendency, is that basically for running text, NASA has become the reference point. But um, the, what we have is the selection of sequences of two or three letters that draw attention to the style but doesn't fully represent the style and its possibility. And of course, if you want to typeset text using a case like this, you'd better know NAS style in and out. And if you don't know it in and out, then you will just resort to the simple subsets and avoid many of the combinations that you don't know where it's appropriate and where it isn't. And we see certain patterns that are that are done without any dots, and then we have separate dots. Where are they? We have separate dots here that can hang further above or further below. So the idea now that um, you can use the very basic shapes or you can use some combination, and of course, as I said, it depends a lot on the knowledge of the typesetter. In time, uh, this begins to break down. I forget which English university press uh, did this, but basically it's an imitation of the Bolak case with some uh, refinements and individual changes. Uh, this is around 1970 from Beirut. Uh, a metal said type page, um, front page, a title page. And you can see there's even Reha and Solos and so on, various styles together. And these are set in metal, but by that point, things were coming to a slow halt. From the same book inside, there's even an attempt at a party style right here. It's relatively flat, but it's again, it's a nice, nice impression for heading. So things progress, and by the by the mid-1950s, this is what an Egyptian newspaper would look like. The headings here are all done by hand. They're zinc plates. The, the type is set in a much simpler style mechanically. And, but we have, we have this nice contrast of styles and darknesses. By a bit later, 2000, this is the arrival of the ugly newspaper page. You can see these these are what I call the ugly bowls, where with a certain lack of creativity, somebody decided to, to thicken the horizontal line and do nothing else elsewhere to, to create an impression of darkness. And this was abysmal, but um, there, there's a good reason for it. The equipment, the prototype setting, so on went kept simplifying and simplifying even for Latin script. So uh, applying that same level of oversimplification to Arabic had the result of, of these very unusual, unusually simplified styles. So if you can imagine, the, so the, these are all in response to rising cost of typesetting. So no more calligraphers, ugly fat headings. You can imagine if things cost rose. He, um, in Egypt and other Arabic-speaking countries for typesetting. You can imagine scholars elsewhere that needed to have, uh, that needed to have uh, Arabic typeset. This is a project by a Dutch guy um, 
who realize that using phototype settings, one could break things down into their strokes rather than full letters and be able to do a relatively more elegant style. I don't believe this project went anywhere. When I was a young student, I came across this page and calligraphically it didn't look that interesting or, or nicely done, but it had the same concept come up again. Basically, this scholar at the University of British Columbia, um, Mackay, Pierre Mackay, had uh, found his own solution for using the university equipment for setting his own Arabic, so he wouldn't be at the mercy of overseas presses that were very expensive. And I, this, uh, this idea of breaking things down into components stayed with me, but it wasn't until decades after that I actually got to, um, to use that. By the late 70s, most newspapers and magazines were using this oversimplified style of NASP everywhere. I call it dead NASP, because it basically doesn't distinguish um, all, all the numbers, the teeth here are of the same size, very little differentiation for legibility and so on. And I, it worries me a bit as the generation that grew up on this, will it, will it be able to, to adapt to more sophisticated style? With the advent of uh, desktop publishing, things went disastrous for Arabic scripts and other scripts like Hindi and so on that are more complex in their rendering. Um, the arrival of, um, of PostScript fonts basically stopped the validity, the economic validity of proprietary type setting exper uh, equipment and people were, were using um, whatever they got with the data processing system. So this period for Arabic was very difficult. Uh, documents couldn't be exchanged across systems and so on. By the early 19, uh, 1990s, uh, the Unicode standard came out, and not just for Arabic characters, for all the alphabets of the world. Uh, codes were standardized so there'd never be any duplication between one language and another. So with this was the beginning of uh, interchangeability and publication on the internet and so on, things, things began to change. It didn't happen overnight, but it changed. I'm very glad the ugly bolds have disappeared in some cases and have been replaced by, by quite nice looking things. Uh, so so I, I'm, I'm very pleased to see the surge of creativity. So what has happened uh, since roughly the year 2000 is a wave of people creating new typefaces in Arabic. Very often uh, they have the ambition of, of making the Arabic flow well with the Latin or the Latin flow well with the Arabic. This is something very new and needs, needs a lot more experimentation. Um, in cases like this, for example, the, the two are geometrically similar. So they go well in that, but do they create the same feeling? So this is this is the part that's hard. If it gives, if this gives a casual feeling in in English, does it give a casual feeling in Arabic? So there needs to be uh, a lot more experimentation. Here is uh, a typeface with a very unusual press. Again, by the same designer. This is a handwriting. Uh, this is um, a Ropov typeface done by Sultan Mokhtari in, in Yemen. And he's, he's understood that now we can actually write non-horizontal Ropov. But a lot of people haven't really um, absorbed that idea yet. Here's a takeoff on a Maghrebi typeface, a fresh interpretation. Uh, this is Nastalik work done by Decotype, work of uh, Miriam Somers and Thomas Mila. And as you can see, this is, this is the level of calligraphy. This 
is a nastalik that I worked on with my friend and designer, uh, Patrick Vassal. So basically, this is part of the Noto, the Google Noto project. Anyone can download this font for free and use it. It's meant prior, primarily for South, for South Asia, so India and Pakistan. But, uh, we haven't quite made a, a localized Arabic version, but if minimally localized, it would be OK. This is uh, another one of my projects. Again, the designer is uh, Patrick Vasson. And I did the programming for the font. So here, we're, we, our ambition in this case was to implement a mask which is non-horizontal, has the incline of the calligrapher, doesn't require a plugin or special software. Uh, this can be done in Microsoft Word. So, and it's usable on various systems. We have variant characters, full placement of mark and so on, accurate placement of mark, alternation of nabra shapes and so on. This is an interesting face by uh, Nadine Shaheen. It's a, it's a companion to Palatino. And I, I'm starting to see it in all sorts of things, from signs to even small packaging. And the one, uh, the one main thing it brings is extreme re readability. The style is slightly simplified as a mask, but it gives a certain elegant impression. We have the arrival of web fonts now for pages where you can specify exactly what font is being used for display. And every user looking at that page gets the same visual result. This is something very new. And many publishing houses haven't quite made that discovery yet. This is the Egyptian newspaper in Masri Lyon. Similar case for BBC Arabic. Uh, different design, but with very similar aim. Great legibility, accommodation of small, small height, and uh, without sacrifice of readability or without sacrifice of clumsy styling. This is a work uh, called Nassim by Peter Slemet. And we've reached the end. So.